Um, well, good morning. I'm Carolyn Swinney. I'm a PhD student with the University of Essex. I'm very excited to be here and talking at Cyber Science 2021. So I'm going to be talking to you this morning about GNSS jamming signal classification with a convolutional neural network and utilising the benefits of transfer learning and using a novel concatenation of signal representations. So um, we'll start with an introduction. So looking at why this work is important. I'll mention some of the recent research in the field, um, how I'm going to take that forward. Um, I'll explain a bit about the data set, uh, how the signals are represented graphically. And we'll describe the process used and the metrics to evaluate performance. Um, then I'll have a quick look at my results, uh, summarise everything we've talked about. Uh, the presentation will be 20 minutes long and there'll be a time at the end for questions. So why is this important? Well, uh, Global Navigation Satellite Systems or GNSS technology, so for example, uh, GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Beidou, um, it's relied upon across the world for a variety of applications and it really is vital for today's economy. Um, air navigation systems use GNSS. Um, the financial sector relies on accurate timing information to function. And even things like power distribution and rail travel, they all require reliable GNSS signals. In 2017, a government report um, assessed that the UK economic impact of a five day GNSS disruption at 5.2 billion pounds. And if we look into the near future, 5G networks are heavily dependent on it for precise timing to operate and disruption from jamming would have a catastrophic impact on performance. So the reason why GNSS is so susceptible to interference from jamming is because the signal is traveling all the way from the satellite to, to get to the receiving device. So we say we think about our phone. By the time it reaches us, the signal is pretty weak at around uh, minus 130 dBm. Now, over recent years, we've seen cars and work vehicles fitted with tracking devices so that employers can monitor employee movements. And this has led to a rise in cheap and small but powerful jamming equipment readily available online to purchase. Now, although it's illegal to use this equipment in many countries, the number of jamming incidents are actually quite high. Um, the European GNSS Agency did a survey of interference over two years across 23 countries and there were 66,000 significant events which are deemed to have come from jammers. Now an example commonly used is about a truck driver in uh, New Jer Jersey in the USA. He drove past the airport e every day on his daily route over several months. Um, he was using a GPS jammer in his truck so his employer couldn't see where he was. Now, unknowingly to him, he was interfering with the air traffic control systems at the airport. So although these devices may be small and cheap, um, just plugging into a cigarette lighter, they can have quite large consequences. And he was fined $32,000 for interfering with those air traffic control systems. But in this type of scenario, if we could detect the jamming was occurring and classify the signal to potentially help with attribution, these situations could be resolved a lot quicker. Now, the incident at Newark Airport took months to determine that the issues with the air traffic control system were actually due to a jammer. So really, the first step towards the mitigation of GNSS jamming is the detection and classification of the signal. So moving on to talk about my research field, using graphical representations of the signals with a convolutional neural network for signal classification. Now, there is work related to this field which uses similar techniques for wireless communications and spectrum monitoring. These pieces of work mainly focus on the use of time domain spectrograms. There are two main pieces of work in the area with respect to GNSS jamming signals. Linuswal and Shah, they compare detection techniques using power spectral density. And what they're looking at is jamming signals which are interfering with the Indian constellation. Now their work covers detection, but it does not extend to the classification of jamming signals. And then we have Foray et al. Now they look at jamming classification as an image classification problem by using again spectrograms. Um, now 
they produce classification accuracy with support vector machine at 94.9% and with a convolutional net neural network at 91.3%. Now, as part of their work, they produce the data set of spectrograms and also the MATLAB files to produce the signals. Now, our work really builds on the work of Foray et al. We adapt the MATLAB files to extract the raw data. We process it using the technique that I'll describe in this presentation. We use cross-validation and also a separate holdout data set to evaluate the model's performance and to ensure that there's no overfitting. So let's talk a little more about the data set. Now, the data set consists of six classes, which you can see on the screen. In 2011, uh, Krauss et al, they defined four classes for civilian jammers. And then in 2019, for A et al, they expanded this to six, which includes amplitude modulated chirp jammers, frequency modulated pulse jammers or DME jammers, and narrowband jammers. Now, this is a synthetically generated data set created in MATLAB. Additive Gaussian white noise with a uniform distribution was randomly added to each signal so that the carrier to noise ratio could be anywhere between 25 and 50 dB Hertz and jammer to signal ratio anywhere between 40 and 80 dB. Now the data set is open, you can find a reference to it in the paper. So we've taken the raw data and we're going to look at it in these different representations which you can see on the screen. Our center frequency is 1.57542 gigahertz. So we're specifically looking at jamming signals targeting the GPS L1 band. In the top left, we have a scatter plot of the raw data. So we're looking at the imaginary and real components of the signal. In the top right, we're looking at the signal in the time domain. So how that frequency is changing over time, and that's called the spectrogram. In the bottom left, we're looking at power spectral density, so looking at the strength of the signal and the distribution of that strength in the frequency domain. And lastly, on the bottom right, we consider the histogram. So we're plotting there the number of occurrences of the real part of the signal, um, over 500 bins to like look at the distribution. But what we're looking at here overall is uh, graphical representations with no jamming signal present. So that's our random Gaussian no noise that we talked about. That's our background. Now I picked a couple of others to show you. So we can see really here quite clearly the difference when we add in the jamming signal. Um, this is an amplitude modulated signal. So in the spectrogram in the top right, we can see that uh, signal at one specific frequency. Um, and we can see in the bottom left in the power spectral density, the spike. In contrast, if we look at a frequency modulated signal in the spectrogram, again, the top right, um, we can see those multiple spikes and in the power spectral density on the bottom left. And we also see a clear difference in the both the histogram and the raw constellation distributions. So uh, we constructed a data set containing 1000 image representations for each class. And we did this for each of the four signal representations. And then further to that, we also created a data set, which was a concatenation or a combination of all four of the representations. <clears throat> now we did this by creating a larger image in Python containing all four images and then reducing the size. Now the data sets were then split 80-20 so giving a total of 4,800 images for use with K-fold cross-validation to try and highlight any overfitting. And then to make really sure that the models could handle new data, um, a holdout evaluation set of 1,200 images was kept totally separate from that uh, training, testing, K-fold cross-validation process. So we take the raw signal, um, we represent it either as a spectrogram, histogram, raw constellation, power spectral, spectral density, or a concatenation of all four. Then we use a convolutional neural network to extract the features from our data. So our forward propagation is stopped at the last pooling layer. And we're taking a signal, we're extracting the information from it that the neural network is deemed relevant, um, that we call features. Um, and 
the convolutional neural network that we're using is a VGG16. We're using it pre-trained. So that's us coming on now to the process of transfer learning. Now, transfer learning is where we use a pre-trained network for a purpose it was not trained for. Um, image processing and object detection is an area which has seen significant performance improvements using convolutional neural networks. So we use a VGG16, which has been pre-trained on ImageNet. Now, ImageNet is a visual database used for object recognition with more than 14 million images and 1,000 classes. Our transfer learning is quite widely used and has been shown to be very effective in medical research for diagnosing conditions and the severity of them. So we do the same. We use a convolutional neural network which uh, has had its weights pre-trained on ImageNet. And this means uh, to us that we don't need to train a neural network from scratch. Now, the implications of this are, are pretty huge because uh, signal data in its raw form can take up a lot of memory um, and it can also be quite sensitive to collect. And neural networks are renowned for needing a huge amount of data to train the weights. So we're transferring that learning from the imagery domain to our signals by using a pre-trained network. Now the VGG16 has 13 convolutional layers and five pooling layers. And the fully connected layer, as we mentioned before from the VGG16 is removed, leaving the output of that last pooling layer to be saved as our features. Now the VGG16 expects inputs of 224 by 224 pixels, which have three channels. And that is how we deliver our graphs to the network. We then feed those features uh, into three different machine learning classifiers to evaluate performance, support vector machine, logistic regression, and random forest. Now we've chosen those uh, classifiers due to the fact that our features are high in dimensionality um, and these models are much faster to train. We use threefold nested cross validation to um, for hyperparameter optimization on logistic regression and support vector machine. And then lastly, our random forest classifier is evaluated, um, which includes its own bootstrapping processes. And the number of trees in the forest um, we set to 1000 for our experiments. So um, we've chosen to evaluate evaluate the models that we are discussing here today using the metric accuracy. So if I draw your attention to the right hand side of the screen, the confusion matrix, a tree positive um, is where the algorithm has predicted the jamming signal was present and it was indeed present. A tree negative is where the algorithm predicted there was no jamming signal present and there wasn't a jamming signal present, so it was correct. A false positive is where the algorithm predicts a jamming signal was there, but in fact it wasn't. And lastly, the false negative is where the algorithm predicts the jamming signal wasn't there, but it was. Now the equation on the screen, uh, we use to calculate accuracy. But really all that uh, is calculating is how many times our model was right. K-fold cross-validation, as we mentioned before, was used to then try and give a sense of how well that model would perform on data that it hasn't seen before. So um, let's take a little look at the results. Okay, so what we're looking at here are accuracy percentages. So the amount of times, as we said, the amount of times the model was right. We can see um, from the table that representing the combination or concatenation of those four signals performs the highest, with the power spectral density being the next highest in accuracy. Now, this is interesting uh, to us because the prior research in the field has concentrated more on representation in the time domain uh, for classification anyway. Um, our linear classifiers, support vector machine and logistic regression produce similar results um, with random forests not performing as well, generally speaking. But what we see overall is that concatenating the images and using either support vector machine or logistic regression produces over 98% accuracy. 
So why does our combination of signals work so well? Well, when we actually break it down into the individual classes, it turns out that each representation is better at different jamming types. For example, a raw constellation is the best for identifying narrowband jammers. Spectrograms are the best at identifying single chirps. Power spectra spectral density, they're best for detecting no jamming signal present, amplitude modulated and frequency modulated jamming signals. And then the hist histogram turned out to be best at identifying those pulse or DME jamming signals. And these figures um, are highlighted in red for you to see. So by um, giving our convolutional neural network all four representations at the same time, we allow it to take advantage of each of the strengths of the representations. And this produces an overall higher accuracy. So what do our results say for the data that we held out completely? Well, what we're looking at now is the confusion matrix for the concatenation data set for a logistic regression. Firstly, the evaluation data results back up the cross-validation scores, and that indicates to us that our model does generalise well to new data and it is not overfitting. Our confusion matrix also shows that we can classify the type of jamming signal at 98% accuracy. We can see um, a very slight misclassification occurs between narrowband and chirp signals, between no jamming signal and chirp, and also between AM and FM jamming signals. However, these misclassifications are extremely low. So in summary, um, we've shown a sort of novel approach to the classification of GNSS jamming signals by considering a concatenation of power spectral density, spectrogram, raw constellation and histogram representations of the signal. Now, um, detecting and classifying jamming signals is highly significant <clears throat> due to how reliant our economy is on reliable timing signals from us using the banking app on our phone to enabling 5G performance. For our work, we have used an open data set. Um, we've showed various graphical representations of different signals. We've showed the reason why the concatenation of representations produces a higher accuracy, as each signal representation has shown to, to have a particular strength. For example, the raw constellations being best for classifying narrowband signals while spectrograms were better for classifying chirp signals. Now, the concatenation um, uses the strengths of, of each individual signal representation to produce the highest accuracy in the results. Using a transfer learning approach with the VGG16 uh, convolutional neural network, pre-trained with those image net weights, we've shown that concatenation approach to achieve a mean uh, classification accuracy of 98%. This does outperform previous research in the field, which has concentrated more on spectrogram time domain image representation. And then the process of transfer learning uh, by using a pre-trained convolutional neural network, uh, which allows us to achieve high accuracy without needing a very large data set of signals. And this is important with signal data because it, it requires large memory and it can be difficult to obtain large real world data sets. So future work, um, future work could include uh, field testing with real GNSS jammers to understand how useful these synthetic training sets really are. Um, the issue with real world testing, however, comes with legal constraints. We can't test jamming signals outdoors as we would be breaking the law in the UK. So testing is limited to using Faraday cages or totally synthetic data sets like we've used today. And even Faraday cages are not realistic environments um, as they're sterile from any noise. And we're reliant on that additive Gaussian white noise. So it would be good to understand how representative it actually is and whether um, accuracy levels change significantly when the system is presented with real world, uh, a real world environment. Other types of transfer learning, such as fine tuning a convolutional neural network, which has been pre-trained with ImageNet, 
or even other neural networks such as ResNet um, could be considered to see whether a deeper architecture, a deeper neural network um, would increase accuracy again. It would be interesting to test the network at set levels of noise to understand how much background noise actually affects the classification accuracy. Um, but overall, our results have shown a sort of novel approach with that concatenation of the graphical signal representations and using a transfer learning approach, which has shown robustness and higher accuracy with uh, GNSS jamming signal classification. And I'll open up to any questions that anyone's got there. Sorry, I was muted and I didn't notice. So <laughs> I was just saying thank you so much for this very interesting, excellent presentation. Um, we do have a few questions for you. So the first is from Dr. Siller. Great piece of work. Did you compare VGG16 with other notable pre-trained models like ResNet50 or GoogleNet? No, we didn't, but that's definitely on the list for something to try, especially uh, with the deeper architectures like ResNet. It would be really interesting to see whether a deeper neural network would uh, improve those accuracy results again or whether there isn't any difference. Perfect. The second question is, what was the rationale for K equals five? I think that's regarding the K-fold cross-validation. Did you try tenfold or, or less? Uh, yeah, so the rationale for five uh, was, um, well, there's a reference in the paper actually, but um, the, there was a document that we sort of found that said that it, five and 10 were, you know, the sort of go-to uh, cross-validation for, for research. We did uh, try it with 10, but obviously it takes a lot more computational power. So um, five seemed to be a better choice for us. Um, Fair enough. Um, and um, the last question from, from the audience is, great presentation. Since your current work relies on synthetic data set, in your opinion, how do you think it will perform on real data? I think you touched this on, on in the future work, but can you just elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, it will be really interesting to test it, and we're hoping that we might get permission to do some work with real world jamming signals in August. So uh, watch this space. Um, but um, but the honest answer to that is that I don't I don't know. Um, there's different varying thoughts out there as to how realistic uh, the additive Gaussian white noise is. Um, but really, we're not going to know until we can do some real testing and due to legal constraints and having to get permission to do that sort of testing. Uh, it's really difficult to do. There's no data sets out there with real, you know, real world data. Hmm. Fair enough. Well, I have a question myself. Did you consider the effect of, of negative transfer uh, when you were thinking of, of transfer learning or, or you haven't really um, came across this or? Uh, no, we didn't consider that. No, that's definitely something we can look into in the future. No, fair enough. Um, just one one last question for, from from me. Um, so you mentioned you used CNNs. Um, I think I missed that when you were speaking. So does the data set come in an image format or do you transfer the raw data to images? I transfer the real data to images. So we used um, matplotlib in Python 3. Um, to create oh, okay. the image data sets from the raw data. Oh, that, that's fair. So my question then is, do you think that, for example, LSTMs could, could benefit given that the data has some temporal relationships or, or no? Um, yeah, I think that would definitely be interesting to explore. Um, I have uh, read about them briefly, but I haven't done any work with them yet. But yes, um, absolutely would be interesting and there's there's work out there with um the wireless uh you know communications sort of spectrum monitoring side um where, with the uh, lts sms yeah fair enough um i think that's all the questions answered thank you again for this excellent presentation oh, thank uh, you for having me <laughs> of course thank you so much and good luck uh